Breaches and cybersecurity incidents are making headlines every day. What are you doing to be prepared? Welcome to the Tripwire Cybersecurity Podcast, brought to you by Tripwire, the show that explores cybersecurity for the enterprise and how to identify and protect against cyber threats before they happen. Listen for techniques and best practices to harden your defenses against hackers. Now, here's your host, Tim Erlin. Welcome, everyone, to the Tripwire Cybersecurity Podcast. I'm Tim Erlin, Vice President of Product Management and Strategy at Tripwire. And today, I am joined by Dr. Eric Cole, who is a former CISO uh, and founder of Secure Anchor Consulting. He's also an author with a newly available book called Cyber Crisis. And we're going to spend a little time today talking about communication and cybersecurity and the importance of communication as a, a practice within cybersecurity. So, uh, welcome, Eric. Uh, glad to have you here. Uh, thank you for having me. It's a pleasure. Excellent. So I, I want to start off with a, a pretty straightforward question of, uh, you know, just why is this topic of communication uh, an important part of information security as a whole? To me, it's so important because very often in cybersecurity, we forget that we need to communicate to different people that speak different languages. I know many world-class security engineers spend their day talking to other world-class security engineers, but when you then have to talk to executives, business leaders, and managers, they speak a different language, and if you don't understand their language and learn how to communicate, you're not going to be very effective at accomplishing what you need to, which is securing the organization. I'm personally, I'm kind of fascinated by languages and, and the use of language, so this is a topic that's that's particularly interesting to me. When we, we talk about these two disciplines, cybersecurity and business, having different languages, um, if you think about when someone shows up and talks to you about a topic and they don't use the right words or they don't speak with the right vocabulary, uh, you immediately give them less credibility. And so for the security folks, I think there's an aspect of credibility here, isn't there, when you're talking to, to different constituents outside of cybersecurity? Absolutely. I, I've spent a lot of my time in the last few years really working with executives and managers and directors to find out why they have all these really smart people in cybersecurity and they're not listening to them. And that's what I hear all the time is they're like, Eric, they don't have credibility. They don't understand our world. They don't understand our language. And I think a lot of that is based on a phrase that a lot of us grew up with, which is not correct. And that phrase is treat people the way you want to be treated. So most of us, we speak the way we want to be spoken to. And that sounds good, but it's false. The real phrase, the real success, not only in life and cybersecurity, is treat people the way they want to be treated. So before you start talking with somebody, sit down and say, okay, what's their perspective? What's their mindset? What do they want to hear? And then present the information the way they want to be talked to, not the way you want to be talked to. And that's going to start to change and make all the difference. Well, so does the flip side of that also apply? Like if you're in cybersecurity, should you expect others to come to you and speak your language or or do you want to you know, behave differently in that circumstance? So uh, two things there. One is whoever makes more money is the language you have to speak. So if, if you're going to go in and talk to the CEO or the COO or the CFO or the, or the other thing I always jokingly say, because I get engineers ask me that all the time, I'm like, who could fire who? Who, whoever has the power to fire the other person, right? That's the language you have to speak. So unfortunately, yeah. yes, we, we could make an argument that, well, a CEO needs to speak my language. A CFO needs to speak my language, but two pieces there. One, their job is running the business and your job is to support them. So technically you would need to learn their language. The other really important part is let's not underestimate how complex cybersecurity is. Many of us have been doing this 5, 10, or 15 years, so we can't expect that a CEO is going to invest the time, energy, or effort into doing that. So to me, that's really where that chief information security officer comes in, is they need to be the master translator that speaks cyber, speaks business, and can translate on the fly depending on which audience they're talking to. I think that's a role that that you know more and more CISOs understand uh, is their responsibility. In the past, if you go back five, 10 years, you know, the CISO was the, the, the most technical security engineer, the person who had, who had sort of achieved all the, 
unlocked all the achievements and security and gotten to the you know the the end of the game if you will but i do think that transition has largely occurred where cso's today understand that their job is to provide that interface to the business in most cases do you still see cso's who 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 don't see that as their role is that still a problem in the industry I still run across that and I always, I always use the phrase, uh, some, not all, or most, not all, right? So there are some CISOs that get it. They're, they're spot on. They know that. But what I find is most organizations don't have a technical career track. So if you want to stay at an organization and you want to make more money and basically get more titles, your only option is at some point to go from a world-class security engineer to the CISO title. But let's face it, if you've done something for 10 or 12 years as a world-class security engineer, you like it, you enjoy it, you love it, and you're good at it. So all of a sudden, just giving you a new title and expecting you to be able to instantly switch and learn that new language, to, to me, is not really a fair position that companies put CISOs in. So yeah, I still see that a lot, where what I would rather do in companies is if you've been there 10 or 12 years, yes, some of those folks can make the transition, but in most cases, it's better to give them a chief scientist title and pay pay them as much as the CISO because guess what? They're worth every penny, but don't force them into a position they're not comfortable with and they're not trained for. Hmm. I mean, the other option is that they they leave, of course, you know, they go somewhere else, which is a, you know, we, we've, uh, you know, we talk all the time about the the skills gap or, you know, the challenge of retaining and maintaining talent. One of the reasons that that's a problem for information security is because of that lack of a a technical track. You know, your choice is either, you know, keep doing what you're doing or learn how to manage people and speak to the business. And sometimes, you know, someone wants a third choice, right? Exactly. And, and I think that's something where it once again goes back to communication. It's a conversation you need to have. So either the executives need to initiate it, HR needs to initiate it, or that person needs to initiate it and say, listen, I like working at this company and I do appreciate that you want to give me the CISO title, but I enjoy technology too much and I would like to stay in a chief scientist role or say, listen, I would like to do CISO, but I don't understand the business. So you need to spend some time sending me to classes or training me or getting me to understand the business side of the house. But once again, it goes back to having an open, honest communication where you're telling them what you want to do, what you love to do, and where your gaps are so they can help you fill that in. I want to pick up on a, a word you used there that was just a, a subtle shift in, in language that I think is important. We, we, we somewhere in this process switched from talking about speaking the language of business to understanding the business. What, what do you see as the distinction between those two and, and how is it important? So speaking means I'm using the right terms. So I, I, I'm i just using the terms correctly. So for example, I could go in and talk about uh, profit and loss statements, balance sheets, uh, income, profitability. That I'm speaking language. That doesn't mean I understand that. That doesn't mean if you put a balance sheet in front of me, I can actually read it or see what's going on. And I think that's the transition is you need to get to a point of understanding because what will happen is if you're just speaking the language, you're going to get in that boardroom, you're going to get in front of that executive, and they're going to ask you a question that's outside your script. Because let's face it, if you're only speaking the language, you're speaking a script. And all of a sudden, your lack of understanding is going to shine through. And that, unfortunately, is devastating to a CISO or anyone in that position, because at that point, the executives basically are going to say, OK, they don't really know what they're doing. And a lot of respect gets lost there. So it's it's important. And when I always tell CISOs that I'm training them up, when you sit in the boardroom the first couple of times or when you're meeting with the executives, I have a rule. You must ask three questions before you give an opinion. So this shows that you're humble enough to gather the information, gather the data, and understand the problem before jumping right into a solution that might be misaligned because you don't have enough data to support it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think we we often forget that asking questions is actually is actually part of communication. So when you're when you're thinking about how to communicate with uh you know constituents who aren't part of your immediate group, whether it's cybersecurity, business, what have you, your ability to ask questions is part of that communication process. And it also can serve to 
you know, to use to use a cybersecurity term, it can serve to authenticate you to that audience if you ask questions that make sense. You know, you know, one of my favorite phrases that I tell my team and my kids this all the time, smart people know the right answers. Brilliant people ask the right questions. We, we often have this society that asking questions comes across as a sign of weakness, when in reality, asking questions is a sign of strength. You are listening to the Tripwire Cybersecurity Podcast. Thousands of organizations rely on Tripwire to serve as the core of their cybersecurity programs. Why? Because we detect suspicious activity before it becomes breach. Our systems work on-site and in the cloud to find, monitor, and minimize a wide range of threats. With deep system visibility and automated compliance, we help you shorten the time it takes to catch vulnerabilities and ensure your organization is following the absolute best practices in cybersecurity today. For more information, visit tripwire.com. That's tripwire.com. So we, we've talked a little bit about the importance of communication, but if you're in an information security department today, or, or maybe you're the director and that CISO role is your path, um, how, how can those departments really work to service that need to communicate more effectively today? Are there some, some practical tips that you can offer for people in that role? A first is when you're going in and presenting to any executive business leader or anyone in that space, really all they care about are four things. What could happen? How bad would it be? What is the likelihood of occurring? And what do you want to spend to fix it? So to me, when you're going in and speaking to the executives, remember, it's all about money growing the business, even in yeah. nonprofits that still has that fundamental theme. So don't go in with 30 PowerPoint slides. Don't talk about false positives and false negatives. Just go in and present, here's the risks. This could cost us $5 million. It has a 90% chance of occurring. And I want 200 k in order to fix that. That That's a, a first start. Second is don't be afraid to ask for help. Uh, what I tell everyone, if you're a first-year security engineer, if you're a 10-year security engineer, or if you're a CISO, once a month minimum, you should be reaching out and meeting with somebody on the executive team whether it's a COO, a CFO, the auditor, the chief legal counsel. And the response I always get back from folks is, oh, Eric, they're not going to take me up on the offer. They're not going to say yes. I'm like, if you don't ask, the answer is definitely no. Now, if you do ask, it might be no, but at least you'll know for sure. But I find most people are more willing to help than we realize. We just never reach out and say, hey, can you help me? Well, and often people who've who've moved into that leadership position are, you know, in part they've moved there because they like offering that kind of help, you know, to a certain extent. So you're more, as you point out, you're more likely to get a yes than a no in those cases. Um, exactly. Yep. I, I love those four things. So I want to go back to them um, because I think they were important. It's, you know, what could happen? Uh, uh, what's the what's the impact? Is that the second one? Yeah. And then, yeah what could happen? What's the impact, the monetary impact, yep. the and likelihood of that likelihood. happening, and then the cost to fix it? And I think in cybersecurity, we're really good at those first two, like what could happen and what's the impact. And we're, we're often really bad at the second two. Um, the likelihood uh, and uh, likelihood in particular is a problem for cybersecurity because we, we, we tend to focus on the what could happen, especially if it's a novel new threat. And we communicate that very effectively. Here's the thing that could happen and here's how bad it could be. But we have a really hard time explaining, especially at a business level, the likelihood that it's going to happen. Right. And, and the key there is don't overthink it because I have people go, I'm like 80%. They're like, but Eric, could it be 83? Could it be 84? Who cares? Right. What I'm really looking for is, is, is it 25? Is it 50? Is it 75? Is it a hundred? Right. You're just trying to get that general yeah. area of perception. Don't overthink it. And, and yeah, you, you nailed it. The problem is people will often go in with either half of the problem. So one thing, some, CISOs are really good at is going in of, oh, these are so bad. We could get hit. We could get hit. $5 million is so bad. They're so bad. But then we never give them a solution. So they're just sort of feeling like they're hopeless. Or the other one that could be just as dangerous is we go in and say, oh, I need 500K. I need 500K. This is critical. And they're like, but I don't understand the problem. So, so why would I give you money for a non-existent problem? So, so the magic to me 
is when you're now presenting both sides. So from my standpoint, I'm going to an executive and saying, listen, we can keep doing what we're doing today. That, that, that's your choice. But just so you're aware, if you keep doing what you're doing today, there's a 80% chance we're going to get hit with ransomware and we're going to have to pay or spend $5 million. So if you keep, if you don't do anything else and you ignore what I'm saying, that's the reality. Option two is you can go in and spend 300K and we can go in and reduce that risk by 50%. Which option do you want? And that's the key part is taking the emotion out of it. Cause I find a lot of security people, when they present to executives or other people, they're very emotional. They're picking a side and they take it very personal. So if they don't get their way or they don't get the request, they feel very upset and frustrated. And I'm like, take the emotion out of it, make it factual and just give them both sides of the equation. And guess what? I don't care which one they pick because I'm giving them honest information so they can make the best decision for the organization. Do you think people get emotionally attached to those decisions because they don't have a view of the whole picture? I, I mean, let me explain what I'm saying there. Because when the when the business leaders are looking at that equation and trying to make a decision about how to allocate resources, it, it's a trade-off at that point, right? They're they're not personally attached to the individual decisions. They're looking at that big picture of, well, if I put the money in this one place, I can't put it somewhere else. And so how do I make those choices? But I think often from a, a cybersecurity standpoint, we come in with one thing. We think this is the only thing that needs to be decisioned. Uh, and it's it's a, you know, a non-zero sum game. Like they could just give me the money or not. It's not that it has to come from somewhere else. So do you think that's impactful on the that's that's how cybersecurity folks get emotionally attached. I I definitely think that's that's a, a big piece of the puzzle because what I find is, and of course I'm biased, but I've had the privilege of working with some of the most brilliant people on the planet in cybersecurity. So to me, people that are drawn to cybersecurity are very creative, are very very smart, and are very articulate. So in their mind, they know this is the top problem. They know this is the best solution. And they are very passionate about their job, that they really believe in what they're doing. So they then go in and essentially fail to communicate saying, okay, you got to trust me. I've done all the work and just trust me. This is the right solution. And I'm so excited that I was able to come up with it. And we fail to realize that while they do trust you, the executives or decision makers need a little more information. They need to understand the problem, the dollars, so they can confirm and validate the decision. Or it might be the right solution, but just not the right problem in the grand scope of the business. Exactly. And I think I think that's an important piece for the CISO because as a CISO, you're not just responsible for communicating those problems and solutions, those four things. I think you're also, if you're really effective, you're also responsible for understanding the context into which they they fit in that in the in the business. Because if you don't understand what trade-offs those business leaders are making, it's very hard to communicate effectively about uh, the risks and their their potential impact. Exactly. And that's one of the things for the longest time, I, I was always a big proponent that the chief information security officer should not be under IT and should not be under the CIO. And it had nothing to do with conflicts or whether they could do their job. It was what you just said, which is this, the CIO is a technical position. They're basically, are the packets flowing? Is the network up and running? And it's really all a lot about the infrastructure component. However, with cybersecurity, it's not technical. It's a business-based decision because every aspect of your business could and is impacted by cybersecurity. So it's sort of that business mindset. And I always do the CISO quiz with people and they say, Eric, am I a good CISO? And I say, we'll find out in 30 seconds. And I ask them five questions. What's your name? Where do you live? What's your phone number? What business are you in? What are your profit margins? And if they could rattle off the first three and then they pause or get uncomfortable on the last two, that tells me that they're not really as strong on the business right. side because a good CISO should know their business, know the profitability, know their competitors, just as well as they know their last name and where they live and their phone number. I got to tell you, my first my first response, mental response to those five questions was, if they give you all that information, they're a bad CISO. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so we, we've talked about the importance of communication here, and I, I think we've we've covered that pretty well. I, I want to make sure that that you know the listeners understand you know why it's important. 
And and to do that, I, I thought we might touch a little bit on some examples of where failed communication has a material impact on security or the business. So do you have any examples that come to mind where a failure to be effective at communicating has some some particular impact or a material impact? Uh, yeah. <laughs> I'm laughing because the immediate thing that comes to mind is, uh, is, is my marriage, but that's probably not what you're looking for here. So, uh, <laughs> not, not a business, I suppose. Okay. You're not, not, well, I, I guess it is, but that's a whole new conversation. But, uh, but yeah. So I, I guess at one level, you could go in and pick any of the major breaches that are, that happened. Any major breach that happened, in my opinion, was a failure in communication. If we just briefly, uh, everyone's been picking on Colonial, so we'll give them a break for a second. But l- look at the Marriott breach. They, they had an older server from Starwood that was not patched, not up to date, contained critical data and information, and it wasn't properly encrypted. Now, let's step back for a second. Do we really honestly believe that the executives at Marriott fully understood that risk and exposure? Because I'll be honest with you, CEOs and COOs are very smart people, and I cannot imagine that if they truly understood that they had an older system that was not generating revenue, that was out of date, and was going to make them be one of the largest breaches in the history of cybersecurity, and it would have been very easy and simple for them to take it down, they would not have made that decision. So to me, if you step back, that was a failure of communication. Nobody presented the data correctly to those executives in a way that they could understand. And nobody presented the dollars to them saying, this is how bad it could be. And in this case, what amazes me in that Marriott breach, it's we have something that has a 95% chance of getting compromised. If it does, it's going to cost us $30 million and our solution is a thousand dollars because literally it was just unplugging the system. There wasn't a whole lot there. So, so to me, that's sort of a, a more global example of poor communication. But, but I'll give one for my personal life. Early on in my career, I went in and I started after the CIA. I was working at a company and I believed that they needed a firewall. Now this was in the, in the nineties. So it was still early days. And I was convinced beyond a shadow of a doubt that I needed to have a firewall in place. So I went to my boss and what he should have done, which is what he did, which is, is Eric, you didn't present any empirical data or information in order to do that. Being the young cocky person I was, I then went around him to his boss and presented the same information. And that person gave the same answer. And I went around that person. So essentially I went in without proper communication, pissed off everybody in my career chain. And after that, I was like, you know something? I, I need to learn from this. So now whenever I talk to somebody and I present something and they go, Eric, I don't think that's the right option or solution. I always ask a simple question. What additional information do you need to make a different decision? And very simple and it's very powerful because what I'm basically saying is I recognized I failed at communication. Can you help teach me what I can do to communicate better in the future? Yeah, you're touching on an important concept for me as well, which is that um, you 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 can't control what other people understand. You can only control how you communicate. And so Boom. this idea that it's someone else's fault for not understanding, uh, you know, you you have to shift that to I need to change how I'm communicating to be more effective, and it it just changes the way you approach conversations. Exactly, and and, yeah. and another one, not going up too off tangent, but just giving advice to the listeners. The other thing I learned, and it's a hard one is I am 100% responsible for everything that happens. So if something goes wrong or I don't get my way (laughs) and I'm the CISO or I'm in charge of the company, it is my responsibility. It's not my fault, but it's definitely my responsibility to fix it. Yeah, it's a very very existentialist point of view. I can lean on my uh, my undergraduate philosophy to be there (laughs) and point that out. So, uh, you know, I want to touch the, the Marriott breach you, example you gave is, a, is an interesting one because you, you implied there that uh, the, the security folks knew about that risk and didn't communicate it effectively. Um, and, I, you know, we obviously can't know the, the details of, of every breach. Um, but this idea that, that, you know, if you know about the risk uh-huh. and you don't communicate it effectively, that's a pretty clear communication problem. But there are certainly situations in which, you know, security didn't know about the risk. And that's a that's a different problem, right? 
<laughs> exactly. And you might might not agree with me. Like I said, I I, I sort of put, push the envelope on uh, on some of your uh, stuff you learned in your undergraduate degree on on philosophies. But to <laughs> me, I look at it as if it's something you should have known about if you either asked the right questions or did the right test or communicated with uh, the right people, then I still consider that a failure of communication on yeah. your part. It's yeah. not, it, it, we always think of communication as sort of over communicating, but I believe under communicating is also a communication failure. Yeah. You can bring it, you can bring it right back to the, you know, the, the comment I made earlier about questions being part of, of communication. So yeah, if you didn't ask the right questions to get that information, sure. Communication failure makes sense. Excellent. All right. Well, uh, um, Dr. Eric Cole, thank you very much for joining us. I think that was a, a super interesting conversation and hopefully um, interesting for our, our listeners as well. I really appreciate the time. And I My, look forward to uh, your, your newly released book, Cyber Crisis. Uh, sounds exciting. Um, and uh, thanks again for joining us. My pleasure. And thank you for mentioning my book. And thank you to all the listeners who joined us. Um, hopefully it was uh, an interesting episode for you and you'll join us for the next episode of the Tripwire Cybersecurity Podcast as well. You have been listening to the Tripwire Cybersecurity Podcast. Join us next time as we explore stories of people protecting people and techniques and best practices to harden your defenses against hackers. We'll talk to you next time on the Tripwire Cybersecurity Podcast.